Fleck, Alder Burnett, Alder Weary, Alder Johnson are present. Alder Nicholson is on his way. Call for a motion to approve the agenda. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Approval of minutes. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Now do item D, regular business. Consideration with possible action on request by Dorwin Tivabau to rescind the special collection charge of $70 at 1370 Harvey Street. Staff. Uh, received a letter in December, uh, Mr. Tivabau indicating that uh, uh, he dis he received an invoice for $70 for placement of a sofa or a mattress at the curb. It's a bulk waste collection charge. Uh, he indicated that he has discussed the matter with his tenants. He's convinced that the material was dumped uh, by somebody else at the curb in front of his rental property um, and asked for consideration in rescinding the invoice. However, going back and taking a look, there are uh, three early setouts and two recycling violations dating back uh, from 2018 to 2006 because of the number of violations uh, that existed on the property. We cannot do that at a staff level. This does have to be appealed to the Improvement Service Committee. So uh, we did respond back to the property owner and made this aware uh, and needed to request to be put on the agenda tonight. So this is for a mattress setout. Is there anyone here to speak on this issue? Okay, I'll okay. make a motion to open the floor to hear from interest. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. If you'd like to step to the podium, sir, and uh, share your name and address, please. Dorwin TV Ball, 716 Columbia Ave, Green Bay. Okay. Um, I guess anything you'd like to share about the uh, I, I just I've spoken with uh, both my tenants I, because they had had some problems in the past. I've worked on that with them. Uh, I've offered them free uh, pickup service, which they have used. Uh, I'll take it to the you know uh, sofas, stuffed chairs, things of that nature. Uh, I'll pick it up, take it to the Mason Street dump area for them free of charge. Uh, I've I spoke with both of them regarding this and it's my opinion they've been with me quite a while and uh, and uh, it's my opinion that they're being truthful with me when they say they did not put it out there I spoke to the neighbors on both sides uh, of them and uh, the state that it was obviously put out there late at night before the morning of the pickup. Uh, I normally keep a pretty close eye on that. I've been kind of sidelined with a broken uh, heel for three months just now starting to get around so I wasn't uh, I wasn't there. Uh, but speaking with them I, I, I trust them. They've been with me quite a while. I I sincerely, this is the first time I've ever contested, and uh, I paid uh, penalties. I, I've been a landlord in Green Bay for 45 years. It's the first time I've ever contested that because I sincerely believe that it was dumped there by an unknown person. Okay. Any questions? And that's, and that's all I can say. I, I can't confirm it. Who did it? I have no eyewitnesses who saw it being dumped. But I sincerely do believe both my tenants, when they say no, they definitely did not uh, dump it there. They offered to show me their their beds. I uh, got the same, you know. Uh, I I didn't inspect them, obviously, but uh, I, I do trust them. Uh, they're good, hardworking people. So that's really all I've got to go on. Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay. Motion okay. to return to regular order of business. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. 
like to make a motion to res rescind the special collection charge of $70 at 1370 Harvey Street. Second. Any discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Alder Nicholson. If I, if I could. Um, go ahead. The, uh, uh, the uh, if I could uh, let the gentleman know that this will go to the city council. Uh, oh, Tuesday. yeah. So, um, what the committee decides today is advisory in nature. So this will go to the full city council on Tuesday okay. uh, for, for a vote. If anybody wants to pull it out and discuss it, they, they can. Uh, but otherwise, it will be included in our report as a recommendation to rescind the charge. OK. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is that all you need? Uh, yes, sir. Yep. Okay. You're free to leave. Or join so the fun if you'd like. <laughs> I know how interesting this must be, but I, <laughs> I, I must move on. Item number two, discussion with possible action on report by Department of Public Works documenting areas of localized ponding, measures already undertaken to address ponding and future implementation steps needed to alleviate ponding. This item addresses issues previously brought forward under the following communications. Do I need to read these, Steve? Item number A, consideration with possible action on request by Dr. Johnson to identify top areas of concern within the city that experience frequent and or severe flooding and report the Department of Public Works plan to rectify such concerns with short and long-term solutions for to staff at September 27th, 2018 Improvement Services Committee. And item B, we'll take these together, consideration with possible action on request by Alder Nicholson to create a plan to help relieve water issues at Main and East Mason Streets and East Mason and Schwartz Streets for to staff at October 9th, 2018 Improvement Services Committee. So both of the, the, the two individual items were uh, referred to staff for study uh, and Matt Heckerleibel, the utilities manager, has been working on a comprehensive report on high water conditions and street ponding, uh, addressing both of these uh, locations as well as some others around the city and we thought it would be best just to bring one consolidated report back to the committee for your consideration. So that report was in the packet that was sent out last week and uh, Matt is here to give you the highlights of what's in that report. It's a lengthy report, I apologize. Well, I don't apologize for it because it is a uh, uh, overwhelming topic. Um, I hope you had time to peruse it before today's meeting, uh, but my intention is to kind of go over uh, what we have done, uh, what we are doing, and then uh, review some of the items identified within the report as to potential causes of the localized ponding flooding, especially during high intensity, uh, short duration rain events. Uh, some of the reasons uh, that we have been experiencing or the conditions that have been causing these uh, conditions are uh, development in itself is a cause of flooding. Uh, if everything was left in a natural state, um, we wouldn't have as much uh, runoff, so to speak. Uh, the type of development, uh, residential versus industrial, uh, commercial, or institutional, and that has an impact on the runoff coefficient or um, whether or not it's a hard pavement, a rooftop, or a grassy area. Um, and I'll get into each of these a, a little bit more as I, I go through it. Um, the development has exceeded the original drainage basin boundaries. Um, climate change, uh, nobody wants to admit it, but we are in the midst of climate change. One of the reasons why we're having these mild, so-called mild winters uh, are also producing these very short, high intensity rainfalls. Uh, where we're getting five, six inches of rain in one to three hours. Uh, the receiving water, uh, so the Bay, the Fox River, the East River, um, et cetera, the receiving water elevations have, uh, are elevated, uh, which is creating submerged outfalls. Uh, so our 
storm sewer pipes are full of water before they even uh, see any type of rain runoff. Uh, topographic uh, topography of the land. In some areas we have filled in land, but the surrounding land still drains to these low areas. Um, prime example is the former slough, which is uh, just north of the proposed shipyard area that runs up through Seymour Park and ultimately over towards West High. That area was all filled in. Um, and but the surrounding areas, the topography uh, was never changed, so the ground or the water still drains to those low areas, in which case uh, that's where we're seeing some of the significant flooding uh, occurring yet. Uh, prior to 2001, we did not have a uh, stormwater management program ordinance. So back then, prior to 2001, the stormwater management was get the water off my property as quickly as possible. I don't want to deal with it. Since 2001, that has changed that people have to manage their stormwater on new development and redevelopment. Uh, old engineering design assumptions are no longer valid due to some of the items above. Um, something was originally assumed to be residential in nature and now it's primarily uh, commercial or institutional. Uh, so that's going to create more hard surface, which is going to allow the stormwater runoff to come off that property uh, more quickly and uh, cause impacts to the downstream sewers. Um, differing design storm criteria. Uh, the city of Green Bay has one criteria and we adopted or annexed the town of Preble uh, back in the 60s they had a totally different design criteria. Um, so that has impacted some of our east side sewers. And then ultimately the sewers themselves weren't constructed as designed. So those are some of the highlights of why we are seeing um, some of this flooding. So getting back into the report a little bit, back in 2015, uh, council directed us to um, do a comprehensive study of all the flooding areas within the city of Green Bay. We presented that at a January 2016 INS and subsequent council meetings. Um, within that report, it identified that the city is broken into 315 different uh, drainage basins. Of that 315, 113 of those basins uh, had some sort of flooding or high water condition, whether it was in the street or with on, within private property. We identified that there was at least nine of those basins had reoccurring uh, significant flooding. Um, and we selected those nine to do additional uh, <coughs> analysis and uh, engineering design. I'm going to uh, on the second page, there's a map uh, of the report. Uh, the basins highlighted in pink were the original nine basins. Uh, 106, 108, 116, 130, 309, 162, um, 231, 417, and a portion of 235. Subsequently, um, additional requests came in for this current flooding that occurred that included uh, the two light blue areas within the, uh, the map, uh, which would include the East Mason Corridor and the uh, uh, Locust Corridor over by Mason Manor. So one thing I want to kind of note is that stormwater runoff exceeding the capacity of the storm sewer is not necessarily always flooding. Excessive runoff that is retained within the public right of way and does not result in property damage is, conser uh, is conser considered to be a short term nuisance pond, and then some allowances for these conditions must be tolerated. Our efforts will be confined uh, to areas where excessive runoff has potential to extend beyond the right-of-way 
resulting in property damage. Uh, with the, we had two significant storms in this year, uh, the August 28th storm and the September 17th storm, uh, both of which had excessively high intensity rainfall in a short period of time. The City of Green Bay storm sewer is designed to what is known as a 10-year, 24-hour storm. What that means is um, we'll have about 3.8 inches of rain in a 24-hour period. So roughly 3 sixteenths of an inch of rain per hour would be a consistent 10-year, 20, 24-hour rain event. What we were seeing on those other two rain events uh, were upwards to three to six inches in one to three hours. Uh, so that, that exceeds the, in some cases, the thousand year rain event, what is known as the thousand year rain event. So that was one of the topics was um, climate change, short duration, duration intense storms. It's not matching up with our storm sewer design criteria. Um, the type of development, so impervious areas, hard surfaces, again, allow that runoff to more quickly come off the sites, get to the storm sewers, and impact downstream sewers. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, today's stormwater management requirements require property owners, developers, to ma manage the stormwater on their site, to slow that water release, to help normal storm events or larger storm events uh, be managed by the existing downstream infrastructure. I mentioned uh, submerged outfalls. What that is is um, the Fox River has, the Fox River in the Bay, the elevation has risen to a point where some of the pipes are now underwater. There is, um, in some cases, the storm sewer in the downtown area will be impacted for upwards to six, seven, eight blocks uh, away from the river. And that would be fully submerged. So that means there is no room in that pipe to accept new water. So the only way to accept new water is to allow the water to pond on the street, push down on that existing water in the storm sewer and try and push it out. So in this case, ponding is good because it is getting the water out. Um, and ultimately with all of these uh, incidents, incidents uh, we had the storm water in most cases dissipated within a couple hours after the rainfalls had subsided. Um, a lot of the sewers have been designed more than 50 years ago. So the design assumptions that were made um, were primarily being a residential type development. In the East Mason Main Street corridor, um, again, that storm sewer was designed on the basis of a totally residential area. The Main Street corridor itself is primarily uh, commercial. Then you have the East Town Mall area, the what is now the U-Haul Rogan Street uh, or Rogan Shoes. Uh, you have the um, Shopco development, the Andrew Auto, that's all hard surface imperviousness. Um, so that ultimately allows that water to get into the storm sewer quicker, um, which has an impact on the quantity of water that discharges into the, uh, the storm sewer system. Um, talked about the difference of uh, ponds. So I'll now go through some of the nine drainage basins that were previously identified um, kind of on a basin by basin base basis and basically give an overview of what's the problem, 
and what has been done, if anything, in those basins. So the first one that will be addressed is Basin 309. Uh, that's primarily the Lombardi Avenue, Ash uh, Oneida Street area, and ultimately flows out through uh, Liberty Street uh, at the Fox River. We primarily have seen flooding uh, on Lombardi uh, within uh, Oneida Street and then on some of uh, the inner residential streets of uh, Kenwood, Thorndale, uh, Carroll, uh, etc. Um, this drainage basin, uh, it's not included in the report, I just found this out uh, recently. The original drainage basin was uh, designed for 350 acres of land development that included the original Lambeau Field area and they accounted for a lot of impervious nature up there. The designers of that time said, well, the rest of the design basin or drainage basin was going to be very low residential development. Uh, large lots, a lot of green space, and we know that the Lombardi Avenue corridor and south of Lombardi Avenue is very uh, commercialized. So that assumption has failed. The other item is, um, again, it was originally designed for 350 acres. The total drainage basin to date is closer to 500 acres. Um, based upon the original 350, the design worked. Based on the 500 acres, the design storm sewer system does not work. Um, with the expansions of Lambeau Field, we have required the Packers to do some stormwater management. Two years ago, three years ago, they built a large underground storage tank. Uh, it's about the size of a football field, about 15 feet deep. Um, I haven't heard of any significant flooding uh, recently on Oneida or the Oneida Lombardi intersection since that tank has been impact or installed, but that is one of the um, projects that has gone into trying to relieve some flooding in that area. Um, where all this information has come up, again, is uh, with the Brown County Expo Center. I have had some recent discussions with uh, Village of Ashwaubenon staff that, to make sure that they require some stormwater management, uh, meeting the city's requirements to try and reduce the amount of water coming from uh, the Rush Center, uh, Expo Center areas, uh, because we do accept some of their storm water into our storm sewer system. Would that basin also uh, contain Gross Avenue? Portions of Gross, yes. Okay, so for what it's worth, there has been flooding on Gross. So just anecdotally, if you could please keep that in mind, so when you are working with the county, um, that that's information that you have handy. Where on Gross? Uh, towards, towards Lombardi. <coughs> so, well, I mean, Gross is at the intersection with Lombardi as well as Holmgren. So, Ashwaubenon right. comes up and, yeah, we drain that whole kind of quadrant. Um, basically, it's from Liberty to the South City limits, the Fox River, <coughs> hit and miss up to Oneida Street. Mm -hmm plus the Lambeau Field area okay. is kind of the general drainage area. So, and again, I mean, that adds into the, the uh, Thorndale, Kenwood, uh, Carroll, and that grows right in that area mm -hmm. as well, so. Uh, Basin 417, um, it's the former area, 2400 block of the former University Avenue where the new festival and quick trip have gone up. That area was continually flooding uh, along university, the former University Avenue. Part of the redevelopment in that area, uh, we required the developer to upsize the storm sewer and put in some stormwater management devices in that area. Uh, they did some underground detention and some biofiltration for additional storage. Um, 
the only place I am aware of some flooding right now is at the actual intersection of Sturgeon Bay Road and uh, University right by the signals there and that's because it's a flumed inlet or flumed outlet off the road into a grassy area to a, uh, um, a shallow inlet and uh, the pitch on that ditch is very flat so anytime we get any type of ice accumulation right now or uh, any type of debris buildup, it's holding the water back into the road. Uh, it's a maintenance issue. One of the things we're going to do is see if we can lower that inlet and create a deeper pitch, uh, steeper pitch on that ditch to uh, get the water to drain into the, uh, the storm sewer system there. So, uh, Basin 231, which is the Elizabeth Street corridor from Main Street to University Avenue and at University Avenue from Elizabeth to Acme Street by American Foods. Uh, both Elizabeth and University in that area have been known for significant flooding. That was part of the uh, former town of Preble and uh, that was identified in a study within the, uh, known as the Preble study back in the uh, early 90s. And uh, so it was on our list to do some upgrades on. We finished up that project this summer um, at a cost of about $1.1 million to upgrade the storm sewer for that uh, corridor. Basin 162 um, is an area bounded by the East River up to Eastman Avenue from Webster to St. George. We saw a lot of flooding in the uh, 1100 block of Smith Street and then along the Webster Avenue corridor. Um, we knew this has been a problem area. Uh, it is controlled by a storm lift station. The 1100 block of Smith is actually one of the lower areas uh, within that area. The storm sewer within Smith Street itself was undersized. And uh, so we had a consultant take a look at that and make recommendations. <coughs> we started implementing those recommendations, uh, reconstructing Smith and St. George this summer. And then part of the DOT contract for uh, Northwestern Avenue is to continue upgrading or uh, upsizing the storm sewer within Northwestern along with creating a boulevard section that is lower than the road that will act as a detention area in that area. So um, that should mathematically take care of the flooding in that area. Um, so we uh, have gone and uh, proceeded with that. Uh, Basin 108 um, is a very small drainage basin uh, which is primarily in the 500 block of South Broadway. It uh, deals primarily with the Our Family Restaurant, South Broadway, which is continually flooding. Um, we originally were going to propose uh, replacing the existing stormwater lift station in there. Due to poor, poor soils um, and other factors, the price of that project kept escalating. We cut the project off at $1.5 million and said we can reallocate those funds to redoing a storm lift station, what is referred to as Basin 110, which is going to be a lift station within the shipyard, uh, proposed shipyard development. Uh, Basin 110 um, is primarily a storm sewer that runs up Clinton Street from uh, the former slough and ultimately then um, collects water from the Oneida uh, West Mason corridor, uh, which continually floods over by our West Side Garage, by Culver's, uh, some other residential streets in there, etc. The original lift station that is at um, 
Clinton and South Broadway was put in in the 1980s to address dry water, dry weather conditions to keep uh, South Maple and Clinton Street dry. It was never intended to take on or be a uh, mechanism to keep the whole entire drainage basin dry. So we are proposing to uh, put in a brand new lift station. The pumps have been approved to be ordered. Uh, we are working on the design of that and that should alleviate a lot of the flooding in that area. And what we will do then is tie in uh, the small basin 108, add about 300 feet of storm sewer and connect it into basin 110. Uh, basin 106, um, which is approximately 250 acres, um, ultimately discharges to the Fox River at Howard Street and will take the corridor um, that services Seymour Park, um, Shano Avenue near West High and Hazel that constantly floods uh, along with South Maple, etc. Uh, this goes back to the topography issue. Um, there's a little map. Um, we have a old plat map from the uh, 1882 that shows where the slough is. And I kind of marked on that map um, where Seymour Park would be located, uh, approximately where fire station number three is located. And those areas are right where the slough ran and those are areas that are seeing flooding uh, today. And so again, what's happening is the topography is allowing the water to drain to these low spots, pond until the storm sewers can catch up. We also then in 2016 hired a consultant to <coughs> uh, model, computer model these uh, drainage basins of 106, 108, um, and come up with recommendations. One of the recommendations that the consultant came up with for Basin 106, the Shano um, Seymour Park area, is to upgrade uh, about 50% of the storm sewers in that area, along with putting in a large stormwater detention pond within Seymour Park. Uh, we had discussions with the Parks Department about doing a pond there and without any surprise they said absolutely not, we need our park, which we kind of figured. So another alternative um, is redoing some of the uh, storm sewer, revising the storm lift station at Howard and Pearl, and uh, still looking at some sort of detention system. So what we are proposing right now is looking at underground detention within Seymour Park, significantly upgrading the stormwater lift station at Howard and Pearl, and then putting in large storm sewer uh, from the intersection of Howard and Pearl all the way up Howard to uh, Oakland. And when I say large, I'm talking seven foot by seven foot box culvert buried about 20 feet deep. Um, that will address some of the flooding in that area. We haven't modeled, remodeled with this alternative to see how it ultimately impacts. Hopefully by doing just up to Ashland, Oakland area, um, we would, don't have to do any <coughs> additional storm sewer upgrades um, further to the west. Basin 116-130 is in the downtown area, uh, basically from Walnut Street south towards Stewart, um, and then uh, from the Fox River. Originally, it was east of Monroe. Uh, the original drainage basin was actually only up to Madison Street, but again, development creep. Um, had a demand that the storm sewer system uh, be extended further to the east beyond Monroe Avenue. Engineering staff recognized that prior to the reconstruction of Monroe Avenue in 2014. 
So when Monroe Avenue was reconstructed, uh, we required that the storm sewer down Monroe Ave be upsized to include areas east of Monroe and try and uh, make the drainage basin of 116, 130 smaller. Uh, I don't know if that has had a significant impact. I'm still hearing of flooding by the YWCA uh, primarily, along with some other areas uh, over by uh, Green Bay PD um, uh, in some of those other areas. So we still have some work to be done there. The storm sewer going down Stewart Street is a 36 inch brick sewer that was constructed prior to 1920. Um, the recommendation by McMahon and Associates, our consultant, was to basically replace all the storm sewer within those two drainage basins and upside it. That outfall, again, is significantly submerged, so it will not accept additional water uh, coming off of uh, the roadways without doing some ponding. Basin 235 uh, is primarily the Main Street East Mason Corridor um, east of Main Street. Uh, it's originally uh, was originally designed for about 1,900 acres. The current drainage basin is uh, just shy of 1,800 acres, and again was all originally designed as residential development. Um, a good portion of the drainage basin left then there again is former town of Preble, um, which has a differing design storm. Primarily, that design storm criteria for the town of Preble was managing the two year storm, not the 10 year storm. So, there's significant uh, deficiencies within the former town of Preble area. Within that 1,800 acres, um, again, it was primarily residential design. There is over 430 acres of uh, commercial uh, or institutional development that has occurred within that drainage basin. What that does is almost doubles the flow rate coming off of that drainage basin, which subsequently makes the storm sewer system undersized. So development in itself is uh, a culprit. Uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s, the Ellis Creek Corridor was filled. That's where the primary storm sewer system is located. Um, again, the primary topography of the area has never changed, even though the creek was filled. Um, the topography of the adjoining land continues to drain to these areas and the area where uh, the new new revised pick and save, uh, the Familia Dental, the Arby's, the Dollar Tree uh, that has experienced recent flooding um, is the low areas uh, of the normal topography. So. Stormwater management requirements were put into play when these areas were redeveloped, but the normal topography of these areas, uh, if you drive by these areas, uh, pick and save is below the main street uh, corridor. And the storm sewer actually runs through the pick and save parking lot. That storm sewer is already uh, 84 inch dialer storm sewer. Um, so upsizing that um, would be to more uh, significantly sized uh, pipes or culverts or whatever would be decided. In 2009, um, Public Works contracted with uh, AECOM to take a look at this whole corridor um, as the Ellis Creek drainage corridor and we identified four potential areas to do um, some possible stormwater facilities. One is what is referred to as the Mill Street area. The second would be just south of Deckner Avenue, um, right behind some of the businesses where 
there is still a ravine. Um, a third would be uh, in and around the hillside lane area, which uh, is near the Vagnon Park. And then uh, up near Auto Plaza within the existing uh, Ellis Creek open channel area. The recommendation was to um, move forward with the Mill Street Pond area, which we ultimately built in 2012. And uh, to take a look at the Ellis Creek corridor, whether or not we could make improvements within there. Uh, the long story short on the Ellis Creek corridor is the uh, DNR and Army Corps of Engineers are in 2000, in 2009, um, and as recently as last year have said no, no, and no because of the uh, navigability of that waterway and the environmental um, impacts it would have on the natural habitat. Uh, even though we would propose to make it better, um, they said the initial impact isn't worth the price in the long run. So out of four potential projects, <coughs> um, we were left with one. The two middle ones, the Mellon and the Hillside Lane area, the consultant basically said uh, we wouldn't get enough bang for the buck. And ultimately, if we did something there, it would just have an immediate impact on the immediate downstream storm sewer uh, and nothing significant uh, in Main Street or where we're seeing the significant flooding. Uh, so where does that leave us in Basin 235? Uh, there isn't a lot of open green space that we can tap to create additional ponds in this area. So we are uh, extremely limited in options. Uh, we have come up with a couple other options that we are mulling around, um, and one potentially being some uh, underground storage within the East Town Mall parking lot. We have yet to uh, have discussions with the current owners uh, of those areas, uh, but potentially capturing the runoff from those developments, uh, existing developments, putting in large diameter pipes, and trying to store the water uh, within those parking lot, underneath those parking lots, uh, to try and minimize the uh, impacts to the existing infrastructure. That idea or concept could also possibly be looked at in the U-Haul uh, Rogan's parking lots as well. So those are some options, uh, but there is not a lot of viable cost-effective options out there. Um, we did take a look briefly at um, what it would, what it might take to uh, upgrade the storm sewer system all the way from Baird Creek all the way up to Ellis Creek. Uh, and that's basically redoing about 19,000 lineal feet of large diameter storm sewer that is within conservancies, within uh, existing roadways such as Main Street uh, and the utility coordination uh, basically would have priced us out of, out of any further consideration. So right now, uh, one of the options is to strongly look at these underground detention um, systems. Uh, basin, uh, basin 560, which is the East Mason Corridor, um, again is primarily within the old town of Preble area. Um, it is listed within the Preble study and uh, the recommendation within the 1991 Preble study is uh, for a total remove and replace of the storm sewer from the outfall at the East River near Amy Street all the way up um, to Abrams to East Mason, East Mason, all the way up to uh, to Laura Street. 
and that would be upsized in nature and that would bring that storm sewer up from a five-year design up to the current 10-year level. With that, there is also the possibility of doing a um, stormwater pond in the open green space uh, where the radio antennas are located uh, between Abrams and, or Victoria and Hireman. So uh, again, we have not contacted any property owners to see if we can do a pond in that area or not. Um, but that's something that is on our radar. And then finally, Basin 957, which is our Locust Street storm sewer line, uh, primarily uh, run from North Locust, north of Donald Street in the industrial commercial area, south all the way to Colburn Pool or Colburn Park. Um, that design was done in the late 50s with the pretext that again this area was completely residential while the west mason corridor is primarily uh, commercial institutional and uh, has as such uh, created more runoff than the storm sewers are capable of handling under a normal residential design the storm sewer from colburn park down to western avenue is designed appropriately to handle all that flow it's when we start adding the commercial aspect onto it that we start um, seeing some Im minor impacts to that section of storm sewer. The biggest impacts, um, there's a map of this drainage basin and the storm sewer is highlighted in pink. In some of those areas, the storm sewer was not constructed per plan, per design. As such, the storm sewer was uh, flatter and does not accept as much water um, as designed. The water backs up there and as such uh, backs up further uh, upstream and impacts in this case the uh, uh, Locust Street area near Mason Manor. So we're looking potentially at 5,500 lineal feet of pipe that would need to be upsized, upgraded. Other option that we are considering, uh, again, this corridor does not have a lot of uh, green space that is uh, available for uh, traditional wet detention pond. Uh, engineering had considered putting a wet detention pond on the north side of Colburn Park. Um, Sounds great, we have a lot of green space, we haven't talked to parks yet, but it's also at the up, furthest upstream reach of the drainage basin, so it really doesn't have any significant benefit. Um, so as such, we're kind of uh, dismissing that as a significant viable alternative. The alternatives that we are um, considering is possibly looking at some underground detention within the Notre Dame practice field. Um, don't know how much benefit that will provide. Uh, we have not done a lot of uh, analysis on this, but it's something that is conceptual in nature and as such, since that's an area that continually floods, um, it may be uh, a lot of bang for the, the buck. Again, we have not talked to uh, Notre Dame Academy to see if they are interested in partnering with the city to do so, uh, but it is something that is on the table. Uh, another area that gets flooded is just to the north of that uh, in some apartments and some private residential properties, whether or not to consider doing, again, some underground detention uh, underneath the apartment parking lot. So that's something that is out there as a as options. Uh, there's a section in the report called Preble uh, Study Outstanding Improvements. Um, the map there pretty much identifies the sewers that were uh, discussed in the 1991 report. The green line segments uh, identified are sewers that have been upgraded. The red 
uh, lines are pipes that still need to be uh, upgraded. What does this all mean financially? It means a lot. Um, in the section um, of cost implication, uh, throughout the report, I've put in some uh, quick estimates, so to speak, and under the cost implication area, there is the table that discusses uh, what it might cost to do some of these uh, improvements. The bottom line is um, what we have spent in the last three years on stormwater management is just shy of $6 million. Okay, what do we do? A guesstimate to address uh, some of the remaining sewer upgrades to bring us to a 10-year design storm level would be about another $67 million. Um, to do the remainder, utilizing the 1991 Preble study and bringing those costs up to date, um, to do those remaining projects there would be just shot or just over $22 million. For a total of about $95 million. Um, that deals with some of the flooding issues within the city. That deals with um, just quantity. The EPA and DNR have also tasked the city to deal with water quality. We had a study recently completed by Brown and Caldwell, uh, which identified some projects um, within the city that will be required to be implemented to deal with trying to remove additional sediment and phosphorus from our stormwater prior to being discharged out to <coughs> this river, uh, the Fox River, the Bay of Green Bay. They identified 18 projects within that study with a cost estimate of $100 million. Um, those 18 projects only get us halfway to our water quality uh, criteria provided by the EPA and DNR. So that deals with stormwater. We then have a whole sanitary sewer system that we're spending roughly $3 million, presently spending about $3 million a year on to make improvements and to keep the sanitary sewer system uh, functioning properly. Long story short, we have a large infrastructure need. Uh, that's been identified um, or have been commented on a lot. Um, the question is, where do we go from here and how do we pay for it? So I guess I'll leave it open for questions. I know I, I rambled on. Again, it was a large topic, large discussion. Um, Dr. Nicholson, you have a question? Matt, thank you for the report. Yep. Can I get a hard copy of that, please? Yeah. And then um, also, oh, go ahead. I would like one too. As well, please. Yeah. It, it is included within the packet. If, if I, I think hard our, copy. our packets are. We don't get yeah. packets anymore. <laughs> I know so well, each of you have a hard copy. Yeah. I, I printed it off and I made highlights <laughs> to talk from. So I can get, uh, I will send out to all alders. Uh, yeah. Hard copy of this and put it in the inner office mails. Thank you. I, I mean, you identified um, there's an infrastructure need in the in all these basins, correct? I mean, these are just the eleven basins, twelve basins okay. that I looked at. There are additional needs, additional areas that experience high water condition that are not addressed in here right. at all. Okay. So that. 100 million for stormwater quantity just deals right so our need is significantly more yeah uh, basin uh, 235 you stated I just wrote down sewer I believe it was sewer undersize that's the preble area there are have we done any improvements since oh, yeah. the 60s yeah okay yeah uh, did, did you address that I mean I might have missed it it, it, it did, you said they're undersized. Have we as as we reconstruct or resurface roads in that basin, we are sequentially doing. Okay, work. I remember you we're mentioning trying, that before. We're Steve. trying we're trying okay. to coordinate that effort on replacing the pipe with a road project whenever and wherever we can. Okay, 
that maximizes the amount of impact we can get with minimizing the amount of financial outlay. If we have to go out and just do, like Matt was talking about, uh, with the Elizabeth Street sewer, we replaced all that sewer and then we didn't do a road project associated with it. So the sewer came out and then we, we had to patch okay. the road. Whenever we can, we try to co-locate projects so we're upgrading the sanitary, the storm, the water main, and the pavement all at once, okay. or at least as many of those as we can. So as we are doing road projects within any basin, but 235 specifically, okay. we're doing upgrades at that time. Well, what have we been, what upgrades have we done in Basin 235 with our road projects in the past? Uh, Do you have examples? I'd have, to, I'd have to go back and pull the streets that we've... I would, I would like to see that, that. If, if we could have that at our next meeting. Uh, see? Within the hard copy, there is a it's map. It's in there? Um, and you can see a green map or green lines and red lines. And you can, within the study, um, right. it also identifies Basin 235 show you the uh, uh, streets or the areas that have been improved or improvements have been made uh, okay. with the Preble study. With the Preble study in 91, the council decision was originally uh, set up a systematic approach on how to knock out all these sewers, uh, roughly 22 miles worth of sewer upgrades. After the third year of the program, Council said, whoa, this is getting expensive, and they came back and said, um, DPW, anytime you are now making improvements to the road, <coughs> make improvements to the storm sewer. So they, again, trying to get the most bang for the buck. If not, what was happening is, as Steve identified, we'd make improvements to the storm sewer and put a patch in the road. By doing it with a resurfacing program or a reconstruct program, uh, we're getting uh, the storm sewer, the sanitary, the water, and the pavement, uh, and combining all of that. Because Elizabeth Street, um, between Maine and University, the stormwater utility picked up the total cost for the storm sewer and the pavement replacement. So, so for now if we have to do sanitary work or water work, uh, that comes back and now we'd have to patch the road again. So it's a second time that we'd have to pay for that pavement. Okay, so that specific example, Matt, has that improved? We just finished up the storm sewer, I'm going to say just before. The okay, so we don't know event. yet. Uh, I am not aware of any flooding that occurred right. on University Avenue oh, or Elizabeth Street. I guess we'll yeah, find out September. during the summer then. Uh, so, yeah. It, okay. Right. That, that's the best answer I can give. In theory, yes, it, it should. Well, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I mean, it's a it's a big investment, but it's infrastructure, and I mean, I mean, I guess, yeah, what does the committee want to do in the council? I mean, what's the recommendation we'd like to give to the council? Um, I mean, I, I would like to invest in our infrastructure. I mean, it's needed. It's identified as a need. And it's not a want. Um, I feel strong about uh, about this subject because I, uh, I think this is the third or fourth time I put something through. Um, Matt, I met with you over by Mason Street yep. and, and Schwartz and we had a little, uh, I mean basically we have a, a different identifier over there because that one That's piece of property yep. loaded up with dirt. I mean Yep. raised their property, I, I believe, probably in the 90s, I mean, way before my time, and that's one of the issues over there, but I think, I believe that, that, I mean, that's part of Basin 235, uh, correct? No, that's actually part of that East Mason Corridor. East Mason? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, that's another area that needs to be addressed. Um, I guess I would like to, I mean, in my opinion, but I want to hear from everybody, that I would like to move forward and at least invest something into our city with uh, to take care of this issue so that's what I have for now mr. chairman thank you all right thank you mr. chairman um, thanks Matt we can tell you know it inside out you barely looked at your notes <laughs> he knew all the numbers and, um, obviously we've identified pretty well the, the high water issues and the water quality issues which we barely even kind of touched on but it sounds like equally as daunting of a task but 
ha have you as a staff already kind of identified a 10-year plan, 20-year plan? I mean, I don't want to go out too much farther than that. But Right now, we haven't gone much beyond okay. the reporting of potential right. ideas or concepts um, until we get further direction okay. from uh, the committee and council because the big hurdle that we have to overcome is money. Yep. Well, <clears throat> now would probably be the time to start looking at what staff thinks is a feasible plan, you know, 10, 20, 30, <coughs> whatever you think is, is a workable plan because you need the, the crews and the, you know, you need all of that to be able to do it as well. Start looking at that and potential funding sources, you know, prioritize all of these needs, the water quality on the high water. Um, I think that's probably the next step is to see a couple different options, you know, 10, 20, 30 year plan, what it would cost each year and then some, some funding sources. So well, we, we have to start on it. <laughs> the water quantity is largely tied together with our reconstruct and resurfacing programs. So staff is in the middle of okay. working on a five-year program that's going to be presented. Um, anything beyond a five-year plan? Did you say with the water quality or the water quantity? The quantity. One the one we're going over right now. Yep. Quantity okay. is largely tied together with our resurf or resurfacing and reconstruct because you'd replace that pipe. Yeah. You do upsizing when you do a road project. Quality is largely driven by other than just upsizing pipes. So that's when you have detention basins or ponds or uh, one of the things that we have started giving a lot more, um, a lot more emphasis or taking a second look at are some linear underground detention. So what we can do is if the storm sewer in that area only needs to be a 24 inch diameter pipe to carry the volume of water. What we can do is we can upsize that to a 72 and that'll create an underground detention basin. It's basically like making a swimming pool with a lid on it or a, you know, uh, just a holding tank underground, but we can make it out of the sewer itself as long as there's a way to go in there and clean it to get the sediments that are settling out. Um, so we're taking a look at a couple of those kind of options. The quality type projects, the ponds, the settling bases, things like that, are often looked at independent of road projects because they don't always line up with where a road is. So those projects are independently being programmed on their own five-year plan. Again, we can start taking a look at what it's going to take on an average annual basis in today's dollars. But anything out beyond five years really starts getting sketchy at best as far as our ability to deliver that because a combination of change in priorities, regulatory oversight, which has been a big thing for us to have to deal with. As we get a plan, you're, you're laid out there X number of years into the future, this is where we're going, and then we get a new directive from the EPA and that forces us to go back and reshuffle the deck. So that generally speaking, a rolling yeah. five-year plan is about the best we can provide any kind of accuracy on. Well, doing that, <coughs> how many five-year plans would it take to knock out that list of $94 million worth of projects? I think that's what we want to know. It's tough to go back to people and say, well, what's your plan to fix all these? Well, you know, we kind of handle it on five years at a time, and we're not sure where you fit in the priority. We could be in this five-year, could be in the, the fourth five-year plan. I think we need to say, here's our priorities, we're going to knock this out, we're going to knock this, 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 this. And then... Depends how much money we'll have. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I want to hear... A, on a fiscal basis, I'm saying you're looking between 20 and 40 years. All right. Well, then that, that's... Unknown caller. That's good so, to know. Um, and that, again, is just dealing with the quantity side. So we only have so much bonding capacity uh, on a city level, so everything can't go towards the storm sewer quantity. If not, we could knock this out yeah. in theory in 10 years. Um, that leaves no other bonding capability for roads, for sanitary, for water quality. Um, so it's probably going to lean more closer towards that 40, 50 year implementation. The problem didn't happen overnight. Um, the solution isn't going to happen overnight. Do we have any other funding sources available? I mean, some of the different <laughs> fees that we assess as far as 
That's, um, water that's how it's currently funded now, yeah. stormwater fees that you pay on your water bill. Have you explored that? I looked Just at... Just to repair. Um, I mean, people understand. They know the flooding can be bad. They'll understand if that has to increase to repair it. Uh, it's I, either I, that or borrowing or both. It's going to be both. I took a look briefly, and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but to look at an additional... Ten million dollars of bonding per year on the stormwater utility rate, I believe, would raise the current rate is around eighty, eighty-five dollars per ERU per household, standard household. It would take that eighty-five dollars, and I believe it would raise it almost to one hundred and eighty dollars per year. So there's a significant impact right. on the stormwater utility rate. That's all for now. Okay. Well, you know, and I've, I kind of brought this forward as well, and, and, and in addition to Alder Nicholson with some concerns in his area, and, and I think for us to do nothing is not an option. And I'm not just, it's not to suggest that you guys aren't doing anything. I know you're, you're doing what you can with the resources you have. And, and that's where we come into play. I think we've got this information. This is very valuable. I thank you for that. This is far more robust than I expected, and this is great. So I think now we're at the, now what stage and that's where I think the council comes into play and the flooding has been a discussion streets and infrastructure has been a discussion um, police and fire and restoring those back to appropriate levels has, has been a discussion I mean, these are basic services that are currently underfunded and I think we have to figure out how we're going to do this and INS can't be the committee that exclusively services that um, at least in, in my short time on council, I have not heard of a comprehensive five-year plan um, that addresses how we're going to handle all those things in addition to debt reduction and how that um, works with, with bonding and other fees that, that are assessed for different services. And so I, I, this is maybe the inexperience coming out, but does it make sense for us to refer this to Finance Committee uh, with the request to come up with a five-year plan for all of these needs? Finance already has that. They do? Yeah. That's a communication from Finance Committee, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, looking to uh, Alderdorf. Was there or was there not a request at Finance to have the Finance Department spearhead a effort on behalf of all city departments to put together a comprehensive <laughs> five-year program? There was. Okay. It's so not that, done. That's so already done. So Diana is working on that? That's already being be. worked on. Correct. And is it? And I, I presume then, uh, Director Greener, that that's taking into account, in, in this, for the scope of this committee, taking into account all of your needs from a public infrastructure. That will be taking our five-year program into account as well. Yes. Okay. So if that's in progress, then perhaps just receiving and placing in file is appropriate action right now. No, I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Oh no. I guess I, I'm, I'm open. I mean, to your recommendation. What, what, what I want this to be on the. Um, I want some type of update so it just doesn't fall to the wayside William and Johnson okay um, I'm sorry for interrupting but no. uh, this is this is a We're huge project a huge investment uh, and we have an issue and um, I, I don't want receiving place on file I mean that's that's mm -hmm. just my opinion I, I we should just keep this um, in front of us um, either some type of update or just uh, just on the agenda, so we're familiar with it, and uh, it doesn't go away. That's that's my opinion. I just want to ask Steve um, that to keep this moving forward. What do you recommend for a well, proper motion? Because um, I believe uh, from Mr. Johnson and Mr. Worry, and I don't know about Mr. Burnett, but we want this to move forward uh, once we have all the facts. Well, what I what I can tell you is, regardless of what action the committee takes regarding the report the findings of the report will continue to move forward that this forms the basis of how we're structuring our input for the storm sewer portion of our program our five-year program so the recommendations that we've come up with there are at least the concerns that we've identified we will continue to use this data and we're not only going to use this data periodically we do go back and we have the consultants come back in and we have them refresh the data to make sure that what was a priority three years ago continues to be a priority or have we found other areas 
Okay. And a lot of complaints popped up. We continuously use this information to help select those projects that go into our program. So, okay. If, if you recommend that staff use this information to um, to help drive your five-year program, that would be uh, that would be. A, but that's what we're doing already. Um, if you tell us to implement the recommendations of the report, that's what we're doing already. That's how we put our five-year program together. If you if you say this was a great report, uh, received in place on file, we're still going to do what's listed in this report because that's how we build that five-year plan. Okay, I understand that. I just don't. I don't care for receive a place on file. No, I understand. But and I would as like far to as, as far as reporting out our actions, as far as what projects we did, that's our annual report, the DPW right. annual report. That's where that information is found. Uh, about the only thing that hasn't really been in there, we haven't. If we've done a storm sewer project, we haven't necessarily identified the storm sewer basin. If you'd like, we could tie those back together. If there's a storm sewer project that's done or a storm water quality project we can let you know what basin uh, well, that, that would ties be, to and that, that would be beneficial I think the committee would like that yeah. sure also when fight or Diana is uh, finished with with her um, I don't know what do you call it a report or a study but it's basically going to be a comprehensive comprehensive plan program. when she's done with that can that come back I want that to come back here when it's done with finance well I know that it was Put through the finance committee, so that's where she's planning on bringing it back. Okay. But I'm, that will be shared with everyone. That's that's not a big deal. And we're going to bring our portion of that. Okay. To INS as well. Okay, that's okay. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. The, so I, we the, are the also involved. Portion, you'll still see. Okay. And then all departments, the entire city's five-year program is going to finance. Are right. How, part of how long has she had? It's already gone through finance. No, 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 no. The departments are working on. They're the working on that. Wait, I mean, yeah. what time frame are you looking at? Six I have, months. I have no idea. I, no, I think it's supposed to be quicker than that. Okay. I think they wanted. I can call her. Presumably, and just find I think they wanted the first quarter of. Okay. Twenty eighteen. Right. Some of the mayor candidates might pull up. Well, what? What? I, I still would like to have this still on the agenda, <laughs> and we can at least talk about it, and we can hold it. I mean, it's. Really, it's not wasting any paper. It's still in the, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what I would like. Report back in 60 days? Would that be fair? Well, like I can tell you in 60 days, not, not much relative to this report is going to change. Well, as far as what's being worked on right now within right. this report, <coughs> right. uh, Basin 110, 108 is moving forward. So as far as lift stations are being uh, designed, for implementation in 2019. Uh, Basin 106, which is the Shano Avenue um, Seymour Park project, what we are looking at doing is upgrading the storm lift station at Howard and Pearl. Um, there is a private development that we are potentially uh, going to be partnering with um, to deal with, which doesn't address in this report, uh, possibly relieving some of the flooding at Military and Channel. Um, right now, we've met with a developer. Um, all signs said, yep, they're willing to partner with the city on doing some underground detention on a redevelopment project in there. Um, the Webster Avenue project uh, is moving forward. So that should relieve the flooding up in that corridor. So we are implementing um, parts of this report as we speak. Again, uh, working with the village of Ashwaubenon to try and relieve uh, some additional relief on that uh, Lombard Lombardi Avenue Liberty Street line uh, with the uh, proposed Expo Center. Uh, so trying to minimize the amount of water coming off of that, those projects. So again, as uh, Director Grenier stated, uh, we are implementing recommendations within the report. Okay. We have not talked to the East Town Mall people. We have not talked to Notre Dame. We have not uh, done a lot of additional um, uh, engineering work beyond potential conceptual ideas on some of these 
other basins, so the, the locust, the 235 area. Um, within our 2019 uh, resurfacing program, we're addressing some of the preble storm sewers uh, uh, in and around the South Abrams, uh, Laura um, areas, uh, so north of Deborah. So again, working on those projects as they come through. We, Matt, you mentioned 235. I mean, when can you approach East Town on properties? Can we do uh, that ultimately, soon? Ultimately, I mean, we're, if this is a direction that committee and council ultimately wants us to pursue, and I mean, basically, I'm waiting for okay. orders. Well, I, I mean, that, that's great that we're addressing um, you know, a lot of those basins. Um, I know there's, I mean, Basin 235 needs attention. I was just wondering if we can uh, move forward on just contacting East Hall Mall and see what options we need there. there I mean, that's what I would like to see. That, that's easy enough to do. Okay. We know the current owners. We know who the proposed developers are. That would be great. As part of those discussions, we can definitely And that's what, talk that's about the part I'd like that. to, that's why I want to keep this, this item on the agenda so we can have updates on basically on the base on all the different basins that that you, know, you already addressed that are moving forward and the ones that are on standby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Alderman. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, now, Alderman Nicholson, you're the chair of the committee. That, that was my suggestion. I recommend that you put this as a standing agenda item and just change the language to update with possible action on the so-and-so and the reason I say that is you mean base in 235 the whole thing the whole Just thing this will be, de this will yeah. be separate than the director's report yeah. and the reason I say that is we are accountable to the public as is Department of Public Works and we are close to spring <coughs> close to a lot of snow melting close to a lot of rain events and I think the public will need to know that if there's a situation where there is a substantial rain event or flooding that occurs in the next month or two or three months or six months that we can say as a council as a committee we have been discussing this this is ongoing that we're not just talking about it in January and then four months later it pops up again. I agree so a standing agenda item with an update from Public Works and I know uh, Mr. Uh, Matthew your time is valuable so I wouldn't expect you to be here at all those meetings but you know we're prepare a short report to the Public Works Director or staff and update the committee as a separate agenda item that we can act on. We can act on, keep it as a possible action item so we can take action if we need to. So that's what I would recommend. I don't think we need a motion for that necessarily. Do you need a motion for that, Steve? Well, are you going to keep this report active? Is that, that what you'd like? or? I guess when I when, when you I say report, report you mean Matt's report the report that we just discussed sure. yeah right yeah. Um, when I when I tend to look at the process of government business how we do business as an entity um, there's something about handling this report and then if you want updates to potentially have a new communication requesting or accept this report and request updates as a standing sure. as a standing item, mm -hmm. but that makes sense. Have, that having makes some finality yeah. or having some closure yeah. on an individual item, especially if we're going to have something yeah. moving forward, to receive and place on file or accept the report or what have you, and then have a new action item coming forward for a standing agenda item sure. on and. I, I'd be happy to sit down with any of the four of you to craft a an appropriate communication to go in uh, to generate that that new standing item for update on you know an informational update or action discussion of possible action regarding updates mm -hmm. on uh, storm sewer and stormwater management activities undertaken by the Department of Public Works for the time period of and identify the period. I can make a motion. Okay. All right, make, uh, a motion. make a motion to accept the report of the Department of Public Works documenting areas of localized ponding measures already taken to address ponding and future implementation steps. You know, basically, the, re the receiving place on file of the report 
and direct Director Grenier to uh, work with Alder uh, Nicholson to create a standing agenda item for future public works meetings. Second. All right, future improvement service committee meetings. Okay. Um, we have a motion. Alderweary seconded, but I know Alderweary wanted to speak yet. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I, I, perfect motion. Uh, Mr. Hackenlabel, uh, do you mind if your second call after East Town Wallace to Notre Dame? <laughs> At least broach the topic with yep. them. I, I don't think they're going to ever want to give up that field because they use it for football, lacrosse, yep. soccer. I mean, oh. maybe they want to enhance it someday. And the, the intent is not to ask them to give it up. What we'd be looking at is an underground right. facility, so yeah. we'd take it temporarily out of service, but it would be right back for their They might be looking at upgrading it anyway, which sure. would be a perfect time to take it out of service, but at least get the conversation yep. started. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. One more question then, too, before we conduct that vote. Is there anything else outside of the motion from a policy perspective that council can do to help you? I, at this point, I don't think so. Um, this is something that I think we're, we are going to be talking about again. It's all going to come up um, with the discussion relative to comprehensive five-year plans because we do have some limitations that are in front of us. Um, there are the financial limitations on what we can afford to spend as a city. There are manpower limitations. Um, I know as far as my staff, we are currently stretched beyond the breaking point. Um, I lost another engineer in December uh, who wound up going to uh, Department of Natural Resources. I've had one out for almost two months on medical leave uh, when you're only dealing with five, four or five staff engineers to start with. Losing two of them uh, is pretty catastrophic. Um, so there's a limitation on how much we can physically get designed during the course of a year. And then the other <coughs> very real issue that we're, we're going to have to talk about as it relates to infrastructure uh, has to do with our contractor capabilities. And we can design and bid everything under the sun, but if we don't have contractors out there to build it, it's not going to do us any good. And there's more than just the city of Green Bay out bidding things right now. And the, the number of contractors who do the type of work that we need them to do in our local area has gone down over the past number of years. So I think what we have seen, especially during certain parts, parts of the year, uh, we have seen that lack of available contractor manpower reflected in bid prices uh, where either we don't get people bidding on our projects or the bids come in and the, and the costs are just astronomical. When I help Alder Dorf with Finance Committee, that's something your committee takes into consideration is sort of the ebb and flow of, I guess, supply and demand of contractors. I just look at the influx of uh, school referendums that occurred this past spring mm -hmm. and think, boy, you know, costs just went up. Yep. with that many new construction projects. So if there's an opportunity, obviously, in that five-year plan to account for, you know, like I said, just, I mean, swings where we might be able to get 10 to 20% more work out of the same dollar uh, by being able to shift where our priorities are. I just encourage you to think about that. I just, that. yeah, so. I emailed um, Diana. Okay. For an update. Thank you. Okay. Any more discussion on this issue? Yeah, so we're, we're, I mean, you brought up some issues now that was beyond the scope with contractors. I think that's a separate item because I'm receiving a lot of complaints from contractors. They don't want to do business with the city, and that's why they're staying away from the city. So we have to, I, I'd like to clear that up sometime, but not at this time because I'm more focused on yep. trying to invest in the city and help um, help with the, the issue we have. Um, so, Steve, with this communication, where are we at then? Where we're at are we moving right? forward? We're, we're at a receiving place on file with the report, and then I will sit down with you as the chair of this committee to craft a standing agenda item for updating the committee on various projects. Okay. Do you actually need me to craft a communication? Well, no, no. I will put the language together. Oh, and it, thank it you. Doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to come through a communication. I, I wouldn't know what, what words I would have the, to Well, as the... You know, As the chair of this committee, okay. you have the right to set the agenda. So what I can right. do is I'll sit down, craft something. Okay. You and I will work through it together. Once All we right. come to agreement on the language, it will simply become Thank you. a standing right. agenda. I got gotcha. you. 
I'm on board. Yep. All right, that's all I have, Chair. So we have a motion by Alder Burnett, a second by Alderman Weary. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Alder Nicholson. Thank you. Item number three. Yep. Consideration, possible action on a review and approval of the 2019 Department of Public Works service rates. Director Kinnear. We have provided to you the memo that we send out this time of the year uh, relative to our service rates for various services, uh, bulk collections, appliances, uh, purchase of recycling and trash carts, improper cart storage, weed cutting, early set out charges, asphalt pavement repair, and snow and ice control. Uh, as we have in prior years, we provided you with the prior year rate and what our proposed rates are for 2019. There are a couple of items in here that definitely uh, bear some short discussion. Relative to bulk collections, uh, bulk collections were set at $70 uh, for three yards, uh, $140 for three to 10 cubic yards, and $210 for anything over 10 cubic yards. That rate was established back in 2010, and that was kind of a blended average based on some, um, on the size of some loans and what tipping fees were at the time. We have not touched that rate since 2010, while tipping rates at the landfill have continued to escalate uh, throughout that entire time. So this year, and you're gonna hear this consistently on, on some of these where we're going up in, in cost, with a new financial super, uh, supervisor in Department of Public Works, we've actually gone back and done some cost accounting based on what it's actually costing us to uh, perform some of these services, what equipment's used, how many men, things like that, and refine some of these things to be more accurate uh, for $2,019. So what we are recommending is taking um, the rate up from, for less than three cubic yards up from 70 to 80, Three to ten will go up from 140 to 160, and bulk collections greater than 10 cubic yards will go from 210 to 240. Uh, we are proposing to keep apply, uh, refrigerators and freezers at 35 and others appliances at 25. In 2020, one of the things we're going to be coming to you with, uh, we are starting to take a look at what types of appliances are out there. And we're not seeing as much refrigerators and freezers, things of that nature, but we're starting to see more and more of the flat screen TVs and other electronics. Uh, so we're doing some sifting through of data on that to find out what our true disposal costs are. Uh, especially with Cyber Green no longer providing that service at our bulk drop-off location. So we may be splitting some of those appliances out to, to some additional categories for you in future years. Uh, recycling carts, again, uh, the 64-gallon carts, we typically don't have a lot of those. We're exhausting our existing inventory. Uh, but the 96-gallon carts, uh, as recycling and, or automated programs have gained popularity across the United States, um, those carts have started to go up as well. So uh, when we provide that cart, there's also uh, labor associated with somebody bringing that cart out and delivering it to the house and then the administrative uh, overhead that goes along with that. The carts are almost $60 alone uh, right now. So we're proposing that those go up from 60, uh, $60 to 95 by way of comparison, um, City of De Pere's 95 gallon carts are $95. Uh, and Appleton's are a rental. They uh, charge you a rent on that per week and that comes out to $6 per week for a garbage car, or, sorry, uh, $1.50 a week. So it's a $78 per year. You don't purchase the cart outright, you rent it. Uh, so ours are still, and this also helps when we've got the carts out there, and I think we've offered a 10-year warranty on it. Uh, what we're not reflecting in the, in the current rate is the amount of time that staff has to go out there and perform maintenance on broken handles, broken wheels, things like that. So we're just trying to recover a little bit of that cost. Uh, improper cart storage is proposed to go from 33 to 38. Uh, again, that is a reflection on current labor rates and a little bit more accuracy, I think we had a quarter of an hour and we've actually bumped that up to a third of an hour to reflect the actual time that an average uh, response evolves. 
Weed cutting uh, is something where you're going to see some changes. The administrative charge per parcel is proposed to go uh, 48 to 52. Uh, the labor, that is more a reflection <coughs> of um, labor rates and overhead uh, insurance rates, things like that, uh, that we talk about during budget time. But the labor per hour what we're looking at is a more accurate reflection of how many people go out to answer these calls. Uh, we didn't have some really good information in prior years, whereas now with the, uh, with the new timekeeping payroll software that we're using, we're able to harvest a lot of this data back and, and come up with some more accurate as far as the labor and equipment costs of what's going out there. Uh, and we used to charge a minimum charge of a quarter of an hour, and what, we're, what we've been finding is it's actually pretty close to a half an hour, uh, including the travel time to, actually, to, to respond to some of these things. So equipment charge um, is proposed to go from 29 to $84 an hour, so a minimum charge for weed cutting or lawn mowing would go from 64.25 up to $130. Early set out charges going for a, a minimum charge going from 50 to 54. The hourly charge going from $118.90 to $121. Again, what you're seeing there primarily is labor costs, including overhead. Asphalt pavement repair, this is something <coughs> that we've really started digging into um, with what it costs to make a repair for a utility or somebody who's digging into a road. Uh, to get that back into a completed um, condition. If the street is just gravel and we have to dig it out and put a new asphalt surface on there, um, adding up the pieces of equipment that need to be involved and the number of folks who are on those repair crews, then taking a look at the actual amount of time it takes and how many repairs can be completed in a day, uh, we're showing that the repair for a gravel-based street should go from 46 to $62 uh, per, square, per square yard of repair. And on a, or that, sorry, that's on a concrete-based street. On a gravel-based street, it would go from 92 to $108 an hour. And then snow and ice control, which we're right in the middle of the season now, uh, we actually went back and took a look at the pieces of equipment that are being used to complete that. Um, administrative charge per parcel is uh, proposed to stay the same at $55, but the per lineal foot cost is proposed to be increased from 15 cents to 36 cents per foot. Again, we did contact some of our neighbors. Um, City of De Pere charges $1.02 per foot for snow removal, $1.00 62 cents per foot if it's compacted snow or ice with a $75 minimum. Uh, Appleton will clear sidewalks at $75 minimum charge with 40 cents per foot. So we think our, our proposed costs are pretty well in line there. And again, going back, taking a look at some of these, um, historically, we talked about bulk already. Uh, the appliances have been steady since 2014 with no increase. Uh, the carts, since we went to automated, the carts have not changed in cost. We haven't charged, changed what we're charging residents, although the cost of the carts uh, to the city, including the repairs, have gone up. Snow and ice removal, uh, we've been a dollar here, a dollar there uh, on the administrative charge, but the 15 cents per foot has been constant since 2012. Um, weed cutting has largely been reflecting the cost of labor and overhead uh, at fringe benefits, uh, with the exception of the change to go from a quarter of an hour, 15 minutes, to a half an hour uh, as proposed this year. Early set out charges. Um, have actually gone both up and down as we've continued to uh, refine those costs and identify what equipment uh, is being used to take care of that. Uh, they were at one time as high as $154.25 hourly, 
and we're down to 121 right now. Uh, and then again, the asphalt, uh, the asphaltic pavement repair on a gravel-based street has been in that $46 range since 2011. And from 2009 up until the end of 2018, gravel-based streets were anywhere from $84 to about $93. But as we've gone back and do, done some true cost accounting to find out what equipment's actually going out on the street to effectuate these repairs. And again, we're not making money on this. We're all, all we're trying to do is cover the costs of, uh, of the, the people going out to, to perform the work. Uh, that's why we're proposing the, the, the 108. Okay, motion to receive and place on file? Uh, question. Oh, Alderman Burnett. Uh, Steve, would the uh, budget that we passed, did it, did it include this projected revenue increase? It did not. It did not. So this would be outside of what was budgeted. Um, the extra revenue, would that just go in it goes to the general, general budget? Do you yes. believe that you would need, obviously this would help you meet your department budget. Do you think that this needs to be instituted immediately after the council decides, or is this something that we could propose for 2000? Uh, again, this was not part of our budget projections for 2019. We're not talking about a significant amount of revenue as well. Sure. Um, you know, we're not going to bring in $100,000 worth of revenue. With all these changes, my guess is we're probably looking at a revenue differential between not adopting these rates and adopting these rates. Uh, Probably going to be more along the lines of twenty thousand yeah, dollars. I mean, I, I don't so quite. I mean, you you laid it out perfectly well. That that I, I thank you for. I just have a hard time. You know, it's charging the public these charges when we just passed the budget. That's all. We're just, sure. In my head, what I struggle with. So that's it. One question. Go ahead, Alderman Johnson. Um, thank you, Director Grenier, for the information. I agree. Like, I, I'm okay with us raising rates to be appropriate with what our expenses are. The one question I have is related to the minimum charge. Sure. And I know a couple times you had alluded to the fact that, you know, the quarter hour was, for example, the standard of one. You found that a third tends to be more of, of the standard. Mm -hmm. So we would bill them for a third in that instance, would we not? No. But, no, we... It, if it was a somebody just ran out to a house and came back for it, did one job, unless they were on site for more than the minimum charge, we charge them the minimum. So, for instance, even if it took them a third of an hour, right? If they had taken off from the east side shop and run out to the to the Red Smith area, but they only spent five minutes on site, we would give the minimum charge. The charge was intended to kind of average out for those eventualities. So it's your mobilization cost? Pretty much. Okay. Again, we're not looking to no, and I understand generate that. I revenue just, off of this. What we're trying to do is <coughs> cover a little bit more close to the actual cost I mean, of providing the service. And you just oftentimes see that, you know, with, with other types of industries where they enact minimum charges and it's a way to generate additional revenue. And I just right. want to make sure that we're not doing that, and, and if in, in reality, I mean, I agree that we need to bill for mobilization, right? I mean, you got to well, load the truck, you got to get on site. I'm just curious why we're not just billing for the actual time. One of the we're there trying to track the actual time is a little difficult with the variety of tasks that Department of Public Works does on a daily, weekly basis. Um, one of the big changes it, that we had this year, especially as it relates to preparing some of these. Um, The expertise of the financial supervisor is in a completely different arena than some of the folks who work. And I've had great employees, don't get me wrong, my supervisors have been fantastic. But somebody who's got this kind of cost accounting background, I've not had this at my disposal in the past, and Nancy's done a fantastic job of really digging in the weeds and trying to figure out what our true cost is. She looks at things more with a business acumen than uh, than anything else. So she's actually been trying to get in there and figure out what is it costing us uh, to provide this service because these <coughs> services are not core services, okay? So we don't look at some of these things 
in the same vein that we do with snow plowing. Snow plowing is something that folks are paying their taxes for, that's a service that they expect. What these are, are charges for services above and beyond for those folks who aren't holding up their end of the civic bargain, so they should be paying a little bit closer to the actual cost. We shouldn't be subsidizing that with totally agree. they're here, you know, the folks are here anyway. I don't think you're going to see any objection from anybody so, on, that, on that front. And that, that's, that's kind of why we've taken this different approach this year, why those costs have gone up a little bit. Okay. My opinion is it should be more. You know, it's. I mean, it, really. It, I don't think. I don't think it's, it's common sense. Overly Steve, surprising I, that uh, we take had, care of a sidewalk, we've had take care of a yard. You've mentioned that to me in the past. Yeah. So, well, you want to add another thousand dollars to everything? I don't care. <laughs> You'll get everybody's attention. Yeah. I bet they won't do it again. If they do, hey, we're making money. Yeah. Well, we'll see. My opinion. What I will say is important to me is that. We have that recourse for citizens, homeowners who are charged, who they feel was an invalid charge, or they have a reason to appeal that. That that I will most certainly, most likely Absolutely. vote in their favor, just because human error. Can, you know, people in my district have come to me with different things, and your staff have been great with the latitude that they have to to understand that. So, so with this, with any changes, I will, will want to make sure that. And we keep that in mind sometimes because the way it looks to the public if it was an error that they were charged or if they feel it wasn't justified then they look at this and go wow i was charged you know ninety dollars to pick up this or that you know it, sometimes it's just an error that they make and mm -hmm. what i don't want it to appear is that the city is penalizing and looking to make money off of our citizens and i know that's not your intention but we always have to walk that very careful line yep. Motion to accept. Or uh, was there a motion on the floor? Well, there's not a motion on the floor. And uh, my personal preference, you can vote it down if you want, but I would like to make a motion to accept but make it effective July 1st, 2019. Second. There is okay. a reason Mo it, it opens Just by motion, motion by Burnett to. Uh, Start at July first. July first to July make effective July first. Effective July first, two thousand eighteen. And the reason is one second. Uh, I got a second from Worry under discussion, Burnett. And the reason is we just passed the city budget, open up for public comment, and I know that you're not using this to balance your budget, Steve. I, I understand that one hundred percent. But the way that it looks to the public for me is that they they could have presented their opinion on a budget that we passed that did not include these fees, and now we're adding these fees you know, a month after. The budget was, you know, voted, not voted in, but effective. So I think it gives us a little time to. It looks better to the public, in my opinion. Just a point of clarification. Go ahead, Alderman Johnson. If 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 this were adopted by council next week, how quickly does this go into effect without Alder Burnett's provision? They're going into effect immediately. Immediately. Okay. Thank you. What, okay, what do you mean by that, Steve? Um, these fees are going to be... The, if, if, if Alder Burnett had not had the provisio in there of holding this off until July 1st, mm -hmm. the fees would, if it had simply been oh, accepted without right. condition, the fees would go into effect immediately. Oh, without morning. his motion. Correct. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, I'm just, go ahead, Mr. Johnson. That's all I want. Yeah, I'm not going to support that. Uh, I mean, these fees are set up to to basically deter people from, or make sure their sidewalks are taken care of, right? Well, it, it or simply meant to try to cover our costs. If they were punitive, right. they'd be a lot higher. Right. But I mean, it's for sidewalks. It, correct. That it's people for sidewalks, should take care of. Uh, and I constantly call pe uh, the city on all. Basically, same addresses, same addresses for grass, to, uh, long weeds, long grass. It's, to me, the public that um, take care of their yards and their property are not involved with this. And if somehow there's a mistake, they can appeal, and basically we give them the benefit of the doubt. But I, I, it's a high percentage, in my opinion, that majority of the people are subject to this. And Steve, how many times has your alderman called you for uh, sidewalk or grass or 
some issue that's beyond the call of uh, service. Well, we, we, I mean, we get these a lot. Yeah. No, but I mean, responsible citizens, what I'm trying to get oh, at. Oh, sure. No, I understand. It's, all, it's basically a high percentage of the same addresses. And I'm sick and tired of it. I really am. I mean, 17 years, I'm still calling on the same addresses, and they still don't get it. That's why That's why I, st I stated, why don't we put $1,000 on it? Mm. Is, will that deter them? I know it'll get their attention. Bet it would. You bet it would. And maybe we wouldn't be getting these addresses all the time, the same ones over and over. So I don't think, and I, I know that there are a, a number of uh, citizens in the area I represent would be for this because they're constantly calling on their neighbors mm -hmm. over and over and over, not once during the summer, numerous times over the summer, every year. So, I, I mean, you could, you could bring, one second, Mr. Burnett, I know if we took a poll, I'd bring you right through District 3, there'd be a lot of individuals that would, would support starting it right away. But that's my two cents, and I am not supporting it because of that. Um, who's next? Who wants the floor next? Burnett, if I, I'll go just, ahead. I don't want to confuse the issue. I'll withdraw my motion. If you want to make a motion to accept, that would I, be right in. That's that fine. Confusion. I mean, maybe I'm out of order, but no, with, with experience, this is what I have been experiencing. And Steve, uh, I call you right away or Pierlot. If I can't get a hold of Mr. Pierlot, I'll call you um, and try to take care of it. Or, I mean, the office at 335 or 3535. Then I'll go to Pierlot, then and you. And I mm -hmm. constantly have been calling the office for 17 years. And so, same addresses. But I, go ahead, Mr. I have a, I have a little bit of a different situation in my district because some properties are tax exempt trusts where when you're dealing with some properties one property owner could get charged substantially where another resident of another property could not because their he properties held in trust so for me in my my district it's a matter of fairness well we get charged you don't get charged and that's what that's where my frame of mind is so I'm fine with drawing the motion I think your motion would one to accept, I think would be appropriate. Okay, hang on, let me see if I got this off. We're still under discussion. Alderman Johnson, or do you want to wait till? No, I support what Alderman Nicholson has said, primarily because if, if in fact the purpose of raising the fees is to make sure that we're, we're recovering our costs, to me that says that as it stands today, we are not recovering our costs and we're subsidizing people who are not taking care of their property. So for that reason, I would also favor uh, enacting it with council's approval immediately. Next. Do you want to vote on your motion? I um, withdrew my motion. Okay. But you get the, I want to comment on whatever motion is made. Mr. Johnson, do you want to make a Move motion? to approve as proposed by staff. Motion to approve that is proposed by staff by Alderman Johnson, second by Worry under discussion. Burnett. Yes, uh, just so the committee knows I'll be voting no, and the reason is uh, for my district until we work out some sort of service agreement or have a discussion with the Oneida Tribe. It's, it's hard for me to justify increases for some constituents and not others. So that's why I'll be voting no. Fair enough. Still under discussion here, none all in favor? Aye. Nays, motion carried. No. There's a uh, writ. Uh, yep, we got it. No one, Burnett. Okay, moving forward. Okay. okay. Four, consideration of possible action 2018 2019 early <coughs> mini storm sewer program. Uh, Director Grenier. Back in so 2017, the we had a, we did the mini storm contract out and the prices came back through the roof to the point where we couldn't afford to award the contract. Uh, then in 2018, we, uh, as a result of that, throughout 2018, we're still trying to play catch up. And mini storm is a combination of uh, requests by citizens, requests by alders, and uh, areas that have been identified by the inspection department as being nuisance conditions. So since June of 2017, um, we have received a lot of requests for mini storm. Now, by way of comparison, back in about 2011, 2012, this program was down to about $90,000 on an annual basis, and Ed Wiesner and I were thinking about abandoning and discontinuing the storm, uh, mini storm project. Uh, we've got nine 
uh, nine requests that came in between June 2017 and April of 2018 that we provided to you in your packet. Uh, we're expecting that to be about a $304,000 contract. Since that time, uh, since May of 2018, <coughs> we've received 11 more requests. So what we're proposing to do is put an early season contract out. Uh, we're discussing that here tonight. Um, put it out on the street in February, open the bids in early March with the anticipation as soon as the snow comes off in April, hopefully we can get out there and start catching up with these uh, these projects that have been hanging out there for, for over a year. And then we will continue taking a look at these uh, these additional 11. Uh, and we're anticipating that could be another $240,000 worth of mini storm. We'll finalize that list up and bring that to you in the uh, in the late spring so we can get that contract bid out um, for a, a fall construction, which typically has been our mini storm contract is in the fall of the year. So what we're looking for tonight, uh, we wanted to bring forward the Quincy Street, the Smith Street, the Soydam Street, 3rd, Chicago Court, Cary Lane, Shawano Avenue, Columbia, and Nancy. Uh, that will be our early mini storm program to bring that through for review and approval. Oh, let me worry. Thank you. What are the streets that were added after that? Uh, we've got, so far we've got a request on, uh, on Langlade, on Calvin, Morgan, Neville, Grigno, Oakland, Chicago, Franz, Langlade, Howard, and Port Lear, and the actual addresses that have been involved in that I'd be more than happy to share with you. Right. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I'll accept the motion to approve. To approve. Motion to approve by Burnett, second by? Second. Weary under discussion here, none all in favor. Nature was carried five. Consideration of possible action. Under request of DPW to modify section 6.35 GBMC relating to underground sprinkler systems. Junior. Okay, the next several of these, all the modifications to ordinance, hopefully should go pretty quickly. I'll walk you through exactly what we're doing. Underground sprinkler systems, section 6.35 of the code. All we're looking to do here, number one, we're going to change the licensing period. Uh, instead of it terminating on January 1st, it'll terminate on December 31st. Um, and the application fee, there's a dollar value associated with the, the sidewalk builders, or this is the underground sprinkler system. Um, there's The fee is actually written into the ordinance, which would require an ordinance change if we ever wanted to change that fee. Uh, we simply changed the language to reflect that it would include the required application fee at the time of submittal. Uh, we changed the suspension. Anyone who would be so suspended had their license suspended. That suspension would not exceed 12 months as opposed to not exceed 6 months. Then we changed the name of the license to an underground sprinkler system license. And you're going to see some recurrent themes on a number of these ordinances. We had various licenses expiring at different times all across the board for, for the licenses that we're responsible for. We're trying to consolidate everything onto the calendar year. Motion to approve by where you second by? Second. We're going to discussion. Okay. Yep, Johnson. Um, I like most of the modifications, and I noticed this theme with a number of them that we're extending that suspension to a term of 12 months. It Can could be up to 12 months. Yes. Okay. It, it just seems to me, and it's kind of... It goes back to a point that Alder Nicholson made earlier, which is sometimes how difficult it is to do business in the city of Green Bay. I'm just curious why we want to do that, make that 12 months, and, and again, continue to restrict our, our pool. I mean, is, is it, it seems a bit excessive. I mean, are there other, other ways to remedy that so that we're not discouraging people from wanting to work in the city of Green Bay? Again, what we're looking at is contractors who would have a license suspended, which is a pretty drastic step. You've got to go pretty far to get your license suspended. And I, th I think part of the reason why some of the suspension times were the way they were, were related to how the licenses expired. I believe the sidewalk builder's license expired in April of the year. So your new license came due in April, but you really only pour concrete sidewalk until October. A three-month suspension was effectively a year suspension, especially if you got it in September. But if, if you want to 
reduce the suspension to six months, and we're fine with that. Generally speaking, if you're if you're doing work of such quality that would result, or you have a business practice uh, that would result in having your license suspended, that license suspension is going to have to come back here. Um, so this committee makes the decision about suspension. Uh, yeah, yeah, we would have to bring it. You award the license, you would be responsible for revoking that license as well. How often does that happen? Uh, I think we've had one concrete sidewalk builder license, two we've concrete sidewalk builder license licenses. I've been down here. And I can't tell you the last time a, uh, an underground sprinkler system. Not, I don't remember one in my own. Oh, we had an underground sprinkler two years ago. Was there one? Yeah, okay. and, a, and a concrete sidewalk builder. Oh, so there was one in each. One each. Okay. So it's pretty infrequent. Good. All right. All right. Any other uh, questions? If not, uh, entertain a motion. By worry, second by. Oh, you did. Oh, we're under discussion. I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays, motion carried. Consideration of possible action on request by DPW to modify 9.2 GBMC relating to tree brush trimmer license required which is number six go ahead okay again what Same we're changing thing. here is we're uh, okay. instead of the license terminating on February 1st we're making it on the calendar year okay uh, changing the application fee and instead of having a dollar value specified by ordinance that it would include the required application fee at the time mm -hmm. and the any license suspended would be uh, you would have uh, 12 months from the date of revocation uh, as opposed to three Okay. Entertain a motion. Approve. Second. 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 Second by worry and discussion. Here, none. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Seven. Consideration possible action and request by DPW modify section nine point two one GBMC relating to right of way excavation and occupancy. Director Gunnar. Okay. This is uh, right of way excavation and occupancy repair of paved areas. The temporary repair we used to. Uh, Currently, we are calling out uh, three-quarter inch crushed stone compacted in 12 inch layers. The crushed stone shall be placed within three inches of the finished grade and the excavated area to be filled with three inches of cold mixed bituminous, uh, which will conform to the existing paved surface. Instead of calling out the actual repair, we're simply directing them that uh, the temporary repair must meet the construction methods and site restoration in accordance with applicable parts of City of Green Bay standard specifications for construction standards uh, for public works construction in the current edition. So we're directing them right back to our standard spec. We had a pretty massive rewrite of standard specification last year and it's going through a minor tweak this year. Rather than every time we update the spec having to go back and do two readings of the ordinance, we simply want to make the ordinance reflect back to the standard spec. So that's... Move to approve. That Motion to approve by Murray. Say goodbye. Second. We're not out of discussion here. None all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Nine, consideration of possible action. DPW to modify 9.25 GBMC relating to license of sidewalk builders. Director Gunnar. Well, I guess first one we had was construction repair of sidewalks under 9.24. That's simply Did a... Did I skip one? Yeah. Eight. Oh, sorry. That's fine. Um, that was an administrative change instead of it saying a cement sidewalk, it's a concrete sidewalk. Okay, entertain a motion. To approve. Down on that. Okay, move to by move. worry, say goodbye. Johnson, our discussion here, none all in favor. Nays motion carry, nine. Um, I already read it, go ahead, Steve. Okay, uh, here we're identifying, you know, again, changing cement to concrete throughout uh, and adding concrete sidewalk and the driveway apron. What we want to make sure is that folks are licensed when they're pouring concrete within the public right of way where there's any expectation that the public may enter onto that piece of, uh, piece of concrete. Uh, your driveway closer to the home from the sidewalk section, that is private property and if the general public was walking on that, that would be considered trespass. However, your driveway apron is within the public right of way. So there has to be some expectation that the public may have access to that. So we want to make sure that the same license for the sidewalk builder applies to the apron. So that's why we added apron throughout. Again, as with the other uh, licenses we've talked about, we've sort of put everything back onto the same calendar year, uh, 
change the application fee to reflect the, the fee in, uh, in effect at the time. Uh, we have changed the bond requirement from 2000 to 5000 That's kind of a, that's a compromise position, I guess the best way to put it. We had $2,000 for sidewalk builders, but it required a $10,000 bond to excavate within the public right-of-way, which you have to do to build a sidewalk. So there was an inconsistency there. What we did was brought it back down into the middle. $5,000 for a bond is not difficult for a small contractor to get, but not requiring them to go up to the full 10000 that we previously had for um, excavation in the right-of-way. A sidewalk contractor excavating in the right-of-way as opposed to a utility contractor excavating in the right-of-way, the potential for causing damage in the right-of-way is minimized. So we felt 5000 was a good compromise position. Uh, and again, uh, maxed out the, uh, the revocation of license at 12 months. Any questions? If not, entertain a motion. Oh, the motion to receive, to approve. Aye. To approve. Second. By worry, second by. Second. For not under discussion, you're not all in favor, nice was carried. I have to leave. Mr. Johnson, can you take over, please? Item number 10, consideration with possible action on the report of the purchasing manager. Item number A, request approval to award the purchase of traffic signal equipment to TEPCO for $40,330. This is a straightforward uh, bid for uh, traffic signals, traffic poles, uh, hardware. Uh, put it up for bid, got four responses. We awarded in each case to the low responsive bidder. Um, the only uh, award that requires uh, committee approval is the TAPCO award for $40,330. The other awards were less than $25,000, significantly less. So uh, use, I'm asking your approval for the TAPCO award. How much do you learn when you sit here and watch the rest of these meetings and take the time? I learn a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a citizen and a taxpayer as well. so. Very impressed. Entertain a motion yeah. to approve? Move yeah. to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion Thanks. carries. Item number 11, consideration with possible action on the review and award of the contract. Ray Nishki Memorial Bridge Hydraulic Repairs held over from the Improvement Services Committee meeting on November 26, 2018. Director Grenier. Uh, we bid this contract out as in November with bids received on Tuesday, December 4, no bids were received. Uh, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Um, the normal bidding period, especially with the holidays, didn't provide the contractors with enough time to put bids together. So we have met with contractors, found out what the issue was, uh, made some minor modifications to the, the bids, and the bids are back out on the street right now. We hope to have them within the next month or so. But as far as the original contract, no bids were received, so we would recommend a receipt in place on file. Entertain a motion to that effect. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Item number 12, consideration of possible action request by KS Energy Services to renew the annual hold harmless agreement for access to the City of Green Bay sewer system to conduct inspection of the sewer mains and laterals. Just in case you aren't aware, KS Energies works primarily on behalf of Wisconsin Public Service and what they do is they drop their televising equipment down into our sewers to check for the location of the laterals so they can locate the laterals when they're doing, a lot of times they're either doing gas or electric and they're doing boring in the public right of way in the terrace areas. So they have to be able to pothole down and find the laterals and they use their television cameras from inside of our pipe to physically locate those laterals so they know where to dig. Um, because they're entering our sewer system, that's our property. We don't want just any contractor in there rooting around and causing damage. Uh, so we have a master agreement that we entered into with uh, KS several years ago. They've been a great partner. They share anything that they find while they're in our sewers. If they see a problem or, or things like that, they always share the data back with us. Uh, so that's why they're entering our sewers, and this is, uh, it's been a mutually beneficial relationship. The uh, city does recommend uh, authorizing this, uh, this renewal. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 
All right. Uh, number E informational, the next Improvement Services Committee meeting is scheduled for January 23rd, 2019. Um, item number two, Director's Report on Recent Activities of the Public Works Department. Uh, under the Director's Report, I would simply uh, identify that we got through December fairly well, um, had some warm weather help us along here at the beginning of January, but I wouldn't hold my breath that it's going to hold out forever. Um, Things are looking good for the beginning of the year. Uh, looks like we're going to finish up last year's budget in fairly decent shape. Um, I did do a interview with Channel 5 on Monday. Uh, again, what we're asking folks to do is uh, adopt the inlet nearest your home uh, and help keep that clear. I know I've, I've gotten some feedback from the public about that. Uh, not entirely complimentary, um, saying that's a city service. Actually, that's not. Making sure that we don't have the flooding on the street, that, that's actually been more of a recent point of emphasis. So I don't have staff sitting around uh, waiting to go out there and do that. So that's why we're kind of asking folks, you know, we're not, we're not dictating it. We're saying if you've got an inlet close to your home and you don't want to see flooding or street ponding that freezes up and becomes ice later on, consider going out there and cleaning that. Thing. I wouldn't worry about so, it. Well, yeah. I, I don't. It's just a little point of clarification. No, a, you know, if, if folks are contacting you and saying, you know, why is the city doing this? We're trying to enhance the service that's currently being provided. We're not adding anything new, and this is not something we've done in the past. Many hands make light work, as my daughters would teach Absolutely. me. Absolutely. What protects their property? Sure. You know, yeah. The Boy Scouts used to show all fire agents, you know? I'm yep. Oh, sure they still do, but that's sort of civic involvement. So Keep right right now we're doing okay, and as long as the warm weather holds out, we'll be all right. But I, I wouldn't hold my breath. I think we're we're in for some yet. So with all those savings though from December, we can now apply that. We have enough to cover half of our stormwater <laughs> issue here, right? Yeah. That actually goes back to <laughs> balancing last year's budget. So, uh, Alder Weir, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> And Steve, I, I emailed you about this, but I think it's good for public discourse sure. too. When will the wheel tax use recommendations come to committee? Wheel tax recommendation, uh, the uses of wheel tax, anticipated wheel tax revenue will be part of the annual CIP discussion. Which is when? When did we have? <laughs> Are we looking at bringing that first, uh, first meeting in February? Yeah, in February? Okay, probably the second meeting in February. And Second part of the question, is that early enough then for the committee and council to take action and adjust it? Because it's not meant to be just a report, here's how we're doing it. It was meant to come through committee and say, well, we think it needs to be tweaked this way or that way. You know, we're not doing enough railroad, or we think you need to do more streets, or... It's not just a report, it's a recommendation. Well, it's, it's coming... It, it's definitely early enough okay. because that happens prior to the recommendation. One of the things that comes out of the CIP discussion is once the CIP is adopted, then there's a recommendation to bring that forward to Finance Committee for bonding, and that's where so this money ties in, is what's being funded out of the wheel tax revenue and what goes to bond. So, you know, I, I've always said, you know, I, I want the wheel tax so that we could do double. <laughs> I'm going to double the road work, so I, I'm hoping to see that or more. We'll see well, what I, comes forward, but I, I can guarantee you, you're not going to see. Nothing. All right, but that's that's the whole reason we have to do more road work, and if we're not doing more road work, uh, I get my blessing. Thanks. Any other motion that we will receive and place on file? Yep. Second, director. This report. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Yeah, motion adjourn. to adjourn. Alder Burnett. Second. Second by Alder Weary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carries. We are adjourned. I'm going to break for hamster bladder people, which would be neat.